One relates to DWP report relative to proposed amendment to an agreement with IBM to extend a term for additional five years and expenditure authority of $19 million. Staff from DWP and the CAO. Okay. And speak, uh, speak into the mic and give me your names. Um, so Matthew Lamp, I'm the Chief Information Officer for LADWP. Speak a little louder so people can hear you. Uh, Matthew Lamp, I'm the Chief Information Officer for Water and Power. Okay. Mr. Alarcon has joined us. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, all right, who's going to make the report? Okay. 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 Uh, let me start then. This is um, an, an enabling agreement to allow us to purchase maintenance support for IBM software that's essential to the department. Provides a contractual basis to enter into an enterprise license agreement, which is a vehicle that significantly increases discounts on maintenance and purchases of any additional licenses we need. It's critical in that it allows us um, a vehicle, contract vehicle for our uh, license, let's call it rental payments on IBM mainframe software um, to operate, and it gives us our supported maintenance guarantees. Um, as we talked about when I was here for the Oracle Agreement, the department has been working hard on standardizing a lot of our applications. This contract represents two sort of forward-looking um, standardizations. One's on document records management. The other one is on asset management and maintenance software, which we use IBM software for. The majority, the remainder of the contract is supporting the mainframe. And it's the department's desire over the next five years or so to be phasing out of that mainframe environment. Uh, but in the um, interim, it's critical that we have support and can continue to operate the mainframe. What's the uh, total amount of the amendment? Uh, the amendment is just over 19 million. The previous five-year contract was 17.7 million. It represents. So, about what's the cumulative total of the contract to date? Ma'am, uh, Robert Roth, CAO's office. The total of the new contract will be 36.7 million. Now, is this consistent with the uh, with existing market rate? Uh, contracts with this type of service? Well, ma'am, this is a... This amount, uh, I mean. Well, I, I can't speak to the amount, but this is a proprietary agreement, or a proprietary software agreement, and there is no other provider of this service or, or software. Okay. Uh, and overall, have your software operations improved through the use of this particular software? Have you been able to quantify that? Uh, certainly, we believe that the um, standardization on the FileNet software for um, document management, and we've moved all our historical records management onto that platform, and on Maximo for the maintenance of our generation plants, the filtration plant for the water system, and all the substation maintenance has improved those operations, and we are currently upgrading the version of the software to uh, further address some procedural issues and improvements there. So it's an important it's an important piece for improving the efficiency of the department's operations. And what is unique about this particular IBM software that no other uh, uh, company uh, well, the, can the, offer? Yeah, this isn't one software, so let me break it, let me separate it. About half this contract is to allow us to continue to operate the mainframe. That's critical because all our legacy applications, the ones dating from the 70s and 80s, that still are core to running the department, operate in that environment. And there is no alternative for that. What the alternative is, which we're underway, is migrating those applications to more modern op applications and moving off the mainframe environment. The remainder of the, of the contract uh, the bulk of it is in uh, two areas. One is document management, and we believe we have, we've been very competitive. It's a very competitive product. We did a competitive comparison before we selected that product, um, and it's supporting a number of, of current and uh, future operations there. The third big product is the Maximo 
uh, maintenance product, uh, maintenance and work, work and asset management product. And frankly, as you go around the utilities um, industry, it's one of the most commonly used and generally viewed even by some of their competitors as at this point in, in time the best in the marketplace. Mr. Cardenas has joined us. Uh, I don't have any uh, additional questions if any of my colleagues have questions on item number one. Proprietary, the only okay. one to do it. All right. Uh, we have a speaker uh, card from Dr. Tom Williams. If Dr. Williams would come forward. Dr. Tom Williams, LA 32 Neighborhood Council and former uh, Fortran 4 programmer. Uh, I've been around this sort of stuff. My wife is an Oracle database administrator for a state organization. Uh, real question, which piece is this related to? What is the overall IT plan for, let's say, DWP, Building and Safety, Fire Department, Public Works, DOT, and maybe Housing. Aren't they all kind of related? Why is each department doing a separate system, especially some of them still on COBOL? COBOL? Well, there was question as to modernization. Can't we get for each department an organization chart or a flow chart, as we used to call them, as to what elements are operating with what elements. There's several systems in DWP. There are several systems in various departments. Where is the overall fit of this particular project and its amendments and change orders to the overall IT plan of water and power? There should be one overall plan, and you should be able to see where this one fits and how long it's going to fit, and how much it's going to cost to do what. Where are the goals and objectives of DWP's IT program? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. All right, uh, there are no further questions. So uh, if there's no uh, objection to this, we'll uh, move this matter. And we'll go on to item number two now. Thank you. Item number Thank two you. relates to DWP report in response to Motion Garcetti Perry Corian Cardenas relative post feed and tariff guidelines and related matters. Madam Chair, this matter was re referred to committee. It was heard in council on November 2nd and referred to committee for further consideration. You might want to pull the mic closer. I don't Certainly. Say it again. So this matter was heard in council on November 2nd and referred back to committee for further consideration. There were three or four key questions relative to the status of the feed and tariff program. Uh, DWP will, will report relative to that. And I do, I do hope that we'll hear today a timeline because that's going to be very important uh, to uh, advancing this discussion. So I really, really hope that that's part of your speaking points because I'm going to ask you about it. It, it is part of the speaking Great. points. My name is Mike Webster with LADWP. I'm responsible for the renewables programs. And on my left is Ann Wood, who is the program engineer responsible for the feed-in tariff program. And so today we want to cover three things is, one, you asked us specifically about streamlining the application process, so we're prepared to talk about that today. Second, you asked about the cost and the administrative cost. We'll address that. And third is the timeline with implementation dates, so we will also address that. But on page two of your presentation, what I'd like to do is give a little bit of uh, background, is that the feed-in tariff program is designed to comply with Senate Bill number 32. Uh, and our share of the feed-in tariff program is a 75-megawatt program. Um, and this is something that's going to be very important for us to move forward with in the future. There's a couple of reasons why a feed-in tariff program is important, besides being required by the state mandate, is that one is that with the solar incentive program starting to use up its funds, we think it's very valuable to have a uh, a solar program that's local, which the feed-in tariff can come in right behind the solar incentive program and augment that so we continue to have uh, solar in Los Angeles. The third point is that we want to make sure that the program is reliable. And these are some key principles that we established during the course of this last six months through a very extensive public outreach effort, is that we want the feed-in tariff to be reliable, which means that it does not 
hurt the reliability of our grid. So we want to be cautious as we move forward, but we also know our grid is very robust and we can handle quite a bit of local solar, but we need to do it uh, in a very deliberate uh, fashion. We also want the feed and tariff program to be cost effective. And what we mean by that is, is we want the program to get the most solar for the money that our ratepayers are investing in the program. Let me, let me just interject for one, one second um, so you can think about this as you move forward. Uh, one of the reasons that I suggested that we start off with a small, and this is a relatively small feed and tariff program, so that you could work the bugs out and, uh, you know, it's a case study. It's a, it's a demonstration project. This is not going to be dispositive of the overall feed and tariff program. Uh, this is just a very small first step. And, you know, I should share with you that there, I, I don't, I think there are some of my colleagues who would try to push a higher megawatt program through now without having this first initial step so that we could see whether this works. And so, you know, I, I appreciate what you're saying, and I, and I have a lot of respect for it, but we have to think forward on this because this is not the end of the program. This is just a small toe in the water, and I would say that it's an extremely small toe in the water. So I understand the 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 need for studying the reliability, and I recognize that. But again, the impact of this will be relatively small. What we're overcoming here is a perception. And, and what we're, we're overcoming here, we have an opportunity here to educate people that this will be a, a tool for economic development and a tool for energy efficiency and, and a tool for conserving energy. Um, so I hope that as you move forward in this report, it, your comments reflect that because this is not the ultimate program. This is just the beginning, and it's a very small beginning. And you will see later as we talk about beyond the demonstration, the 75 yeah. uh, megawatt or even 150 megawatt program, that's part of our cost and schedule as well. Uh, we Mr. also want to make has joined us too. So we also want to make sure the program is dependable. In other words, we want a program that actually gets megawatts built. Many feed-in tariff programs are priced in such a way that no megawatts are being built. Other feed-in tariff programs are priced so high that, of course, they are getting built, but it is not necessarily cost-effective for all the ratepayers. So we want to make sure the program actually works and is sustainable over the long haul, is that we don't want a program that is a, uh, a flash in the pan that starts and stops, but is sustainable so we send a clear message to the market for a long-term sustainable growth of local solar in Los Angeles. But, but I also think you're going to learn a lot from, you know, implementing this extremely small program. That's why I did it this way. So, um, I, again, I hope that we're not going to have to go through this whole program before we start this initial part. I think the, it should be simultaneously. And it, you'll see that in the schedule that we're actually going to start ramping the full blown program nearly simultaneously with the demonstration program. You'll see why uh, in a second. Okay. Uh, we also want to make sure the solar is lo local to our load centers. It makes a whole lot of sense. Local solar builds our geographic diversity and that's important from a reliability perspective and we also value the local economic uh, development. So to move into page three, this gives you a little bit of a view of the cost. And so as we move forward with the demonstration program, again, sort of test the price and process um, that the cost that we have already built into the financial plan for a 10 megawatt program is 3 million annual cost. And the net cost is $1.7 million. Now the net cost basically recognizes that we're offsetting a natural gas type generation. So the additional incremental cost is the $1.7 million. And you can see the rate impact and the monthly bill impact on a 500, an average customer, 500 kilowatt per month customer. And we plan to absorb this in all with our existing staff. So we're going to take our staff, reallocate them from existing duties so that we can get the demonstration program uh, up and running. Now the 75 megawatt program, you can see the cost is $22 million and the net is about 12 million. And this will require some additional staff. Now right now, this is just an estimate and it's really going to be de determined by a process discovery in the demonstration, how many people we're going to need to implement this program and provide the customer service that our solar customers and our residential and commercial customers expect from us. 
So we will fine tune the numbers as we go through the demonstration program. But for purposes of today, we're thinking about 20 additional people to actually ramp up to a 75 megawatt program and maybe 40 people to ramp up to a 150 megawatt program. Very highly dependent on the process, very highly dependent on how we actually structure the full-blown uh, program moving forward. And so with that, what I'd like to do then is jump into the schedule, and on Wood will take that over and go through the details. We have a high-level schedule, then we'll go into a very detailed schedule. Hi, good morning. I'm on Wood, the uh, Feed and Tariff Program Manager for LEDWP. On page four is an overall view of what our 75 megawatt program would look like. And as Ma Mike mentioned earlier, we would like to pace this program in a sustainable and stable manner, and not only from a budgeting perspective, but also from staffing and construction perspective. The schedule that you see there, if we are able to launch this program during Jan in the first quarter of 2012, it will take approximately six months for us to go through the process application, performing our interconnection study, and actually signing the standard offer power purchase agreements with our successful applicants. And from that point, our applicants get 18 months to build the actual project. Now, what we have seen in the past for the solar incentive program, on average, systems take about a year to build. So this schedule that you see here, the worst case is all of the delivery of the 10 megawatts will occur before 2013. But I also want to point out that if a funding source is identified for our full feed-in tariff program by April, we can instantaneously take the lessons learned from our demonstration program and prepare the full feed and tariff program and take it to our board and get approval for that. So if that happens, then we can roll out the first phase of the full feed and tariff program by offering 15 megawatts at the end of 2012. And then with each year, the next phase will be 25 megawatts. And then the last phase is another 25 megawatts. So this shows a steady pattern for sustainability of our program as we integrate the renewable onto our system. And as Mike mentioned earlier, the 150 megawatt program would take the same pattern, um, but instead of the initial phase offering at 15 megawatts, it will be 40, 50, then 50 for the full 150. So, of course, everything is dependent on the revenue funding source ident being identified by April. So, on the next slide, on page five, I have blown it up here for you. It's more of a detailed schedule showing all the steps necessary to roll out the program, provide <coughs> the customers about two months to develop their projects and also provide training for applicants so we can have a smooth application process. And But what I would really like to point out here is as soon as we roll out the demonstration program, we have already, by getting approval from our board for the ordinance addition, we have started the process for the full feed and tariff program already. We're working the demonstration and the full feed and tariff program in parallel at this point. And in January, we will seek city council's approval for the ordinance addition, which will make our program more efficient by providing our board the authority to enter into long-term contracts and interconnection you know, agreements up to a 25-year term. So um, I will be happy to answer any of the questions on the actual detailed steps that you see here. But uh, 
in the sense of time. Um, Why don't I'd you like to the rest of the presentation. Okay. You have the application process to talk okay. about and the reduced administrative cost. Right. So that is on slide six. We were asked to streamline the application process and reduce the administration cost. The four pages that you see on the side there, we have provided actual printouts for you as an attachment. Originally, we were requiring our applicants to submit the Los Angeles Business Policy Compliance Forms at the initial application stage. To streamline the process, we are moving that requirement to when we actually sign the contract with the successful applicants. So what that have, has done was removing the bulk of the work for the application process, and all that is required are the four pages that I have provided as an attachment. So by removing the city forms to the contract stage, we have saved a lot of the LADWP's administration time because instead of verifying hundreds of applications up front, we will only verify the applications when we have narrowed it down to successful applicants. So how do you quantify what administrative costs you've changed, I mean saved? How do you quantify that? We have measured how much time we felt the application, reviewing the application would cost, and the administration cost has been reduced to about 5% of the overall program cost. And because you've taken out what steps? Instead of reviewing hundreds of the applications yeah. up front. Are you talking now, about pre-qualifying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to get you to articulate that. Oh. So you pre-qualify. Yes. Okay. So once we select the projects, moving from 100 to the pre-qualification stage, this is the stage where both parties, LEDWP and the customer, have we have chosen the project and the customer then does the interconnection study with us and have finalized their decision to go forward with the contract. And for those who don't pre-qualify uh, and you give them the reasons why they didn't make the cut, correct? Yes, we will. Okay, and then they can go back and come in for another round? Yes. Okay. So they will they can come back for the the full feed and tariff program which we hope to have the offering the following year. Um, why don't we go to my colleagues, and uh, we do have a large stack of cards on this item in number four. So just to for, forewarn uh, folks who are here to speak, I'm going to let uh, people speak for one minute because we have so many cards, and we still have to get to council by 10 o'clock, and we have more cards coming in as we speak. Mr. Cardenas. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you so much for hearing this item um, uh, in the, this committee when the department presented their six megawatt uh, plan in the council, we had a lot of questions and we asked them to, if they could prepare uh, this presentation within 30 days and they did. So thank you very much. I'm glad we're having an opportunity to, to go over it now. <clears throat> My first question is, um, w um, Ron, I don't know if you want to get up to the table or what have you. I have some broad questions and then I have some specifics for the actual um, information you, you gave us today. But first, I'd, I'd like to remind our, ourselves, Ron, what are the, the, the three or four main responsibilities of our department to our, our, our rate holders and our, our rate payers? Well, those main responsibilities are providing reliable supply, um, providing cost-effective supply, and providing them some certainty with respect to what their costs are going to be going going forward, and then being responsible for them on a customer service basis. So, so basically, what we're doing, uh, and and when we interviewed you for the job, you seem to have uh, agreed with the policymakers and many of the people in the community that there's really a fourth component that we're actually embarking on, which is 
which is, I think, at the crux of what we're doing here, is the fourth is clean energy. Because right? before, in the old days, when DWP was built, clean energy really wasn't a topic of discussion or a policy matter, correct? Well, it's not only a policy matter, but it's also a, a fact of law as, as well. We have we have specific obligations on, under the law, and on, of course, on top of that, there are policies that the the city has adopted for moving forward with a with a clean energy agenda. Mm -hmm. And then also, uh, one of the things um, I'd like to ask you, I don't know if it's this is more of a specific or a broad question and answer, but. When we have a feed-in tariff uh, program, when we're starting to accept 10 megawatts and then going on to 25 and then uh, eventually to 75 megawatts and beyond of individuals, so to speak, providing energy to the Department of Water and Power system, my first question is, how does that, how can that or how does that affect reliability and the ability to keep that reliability? And my second question is, does it have any impact inadvertently on uh, the the overall blended cost that are that we charge our customers and have to manage well first of all uh, council member we're, uh, one of the reasons that we're doing this on a demo basis is to confirm that as we put more and more solar on top of what we're already doing with our solar incentive program that we indeed are not compromising reliability our systems utility systems and ours included uh, were not generally designed for power. They were designed for receiving power from their customers uh, to, to the, by the customers, not having it come the other way. So we have worked through our our, uh, <clears throat> our system to make sure that we believe that it will function properly. Uh, properly, as as Mike Webster indicated, we we believe we have a pretty robust <laughs> robust system on that. So but we want to make sure that we want to make certain of that through this program and continue to monitor that so as we so go So basically forward. on the first 10 megawatts or what have you, the department is is depending on uh, educated guesses. And I don't mean to sound flippant, but basically you're, you're going into a territory where this particular department hasn't gone before. And and so you're, you're trying to, as best you can, figure out how it would play out and how it would be managed and all the variables and what the impacts would be, but yet you still have your four, I call them four now, right. four basic tenets that you are trying to comply with and move forward with. Yes, that's operate. correct. And your, your other question is with respect to the cost impacts, and we've laid out on, on this slide here what, what those impacts are based on a 10 megawatt, a 75 megawatt, and 150 megawatt uh, program levels, levels that we think are reasonable, but levels that, that ultimately our board will need to act on and, and, and council will need to act on as well. Now, now I'm, I'm going to try to make it as quick as I can, Madam Chair. Um, now, in these factors and details that you haven't shared with us today, in these factors, are you having to factor in whether or not this may increase the load, may increase energy produced and or paid for by the department that is not eventually used and then charged to a customer. You understand what I'm saying? In any given system, there's a percentage, right, that just drops off because you have to have reliability. So you don't produce 99.9999% of the energy that you think is going to be needed. You basically produce 100 plus percent to make sure that we don't have blackouts, et cetera. Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, you <clears throat> might be confusing the difference between capacity and energy. We, we, we produced exactly the amount of energy to the exact amount of energy that our Great. customers need. Will, will but we have to have capacity. But, uh, correct. Will this but, cause you to have to adjust to the realities of how to do that with a bunch of individual customers that you don't control when the switch goes on and the energy comes into the system, et cetera? They do. Well, we, we have to have systems available to, to support our customers when these systems aren't providing energy. So, in other words, the solar the solar that our customers produce on their on their rooftops w will deliver into the system when it's there, and when it's not there, and those customers are our 
customers still demand an amount of energy, we have to make certain that we have Correct. other resources to back up that supply. Now, now, those new potential partners in this whole scenario of producing energy and, and feeding it back into the system, are they? do they have the four tenants that you have on a moment-to-moment, -moment, day day-to-day basis? Well, I, you know, I don't, on, just be honest. Do they have? Those I, I don't. Programs? I don't know that they are do. Are they required in, to? Yeah. Are they required to provide low-cost energy? Are they required to re provide reliable energy? For example. Well, if you're if you're speaking with regard to a feed-in tariff participant. Yes. Um, no, they are. They're, All they're providing <clears throat> is clean energy. They're providing clean energy that, from that's their. That's the from number their one line. thing, bar none, that they're doing. They're providing mm -hmm. clean energy, but those other things are not their responsibility. That's correct. That's right? the department's that, responsibility. That is your department's correct. responsibility. So I'm getting to my point. My point is, does this further complicate your other responsibilities? Well, it does. It does complicate. And when it, when and if it complicates those responsibilities, does it potentially or can it impact your ability to balance your books at the end of the day, the month, the year? To your customers, your from, a, from a financial perspective, right. certainly can. And there's, there are. I mean, there's, there's no question that these are additional so costs. Why don't you just roll out a 150,000 megawatt system, feed in tariff, tell them you're going to pay them 14 cents or 15.6 cents or what have you, and just get the darn thing off the ground now? Well, because if we were to undertake it at, at too large of a scale, um, we would have to significantly increase our rates. So we're looking to ramp it up at a level that that, um, that but, the but system why, can accommodate. But why, but why is that? If, are you trying to tell me that if you promise somebody 15.6 cents for what they're feeding in, are you telling me that, that you can't just tell them six months later, I'm really sorry, we're only going to pay you 14 cents? I'm not quite sure I understand your question. Can okay. Somebody comes on. We have a, a, a small energy provider on the rooftop or what have you, and all of a sudden we do a feed-in tariff agreement with them. Right. Is that a variable agreement, day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month basis, no, or we're agreeing for a fixed amount of we're time? Agreeing you, for, uh, for, for every kilowatt of energy you're providing us, we're going to give you umpteen cents. We're guaranteeing a price to them for the life of that contract. For the life of the contract. Right. And what's the life of the contract right now? That, we anticipate will be we're well, planning on a 20-year contract a 20-year contract right so, so for each contract that we enter into they will have a, a, a fixed rate for 20 years okay. for for the rate that they enter into when we when we when we as a as the department and they as the customer sign and, and so we don't have an out in that contract that says well if global this and markets move and gas prices come down or what have you, we don't have the ability to go back and knock on their door and say, you know that contract we have? It's, I know it's six months down the road or 18 months down the road. We want to adjust it now. We're stuck with that rate. Or we're providing price certainty on both sides. On both sides, exactly. Now, my, my second and last question is this. When and if we have a system that has 10 megawatts, 50 megawatts, 75 megawatts, eventually 150 megawatts, are we going to be powering down or changing our, our base load mix as a result of this? At that level, I wouldn't anticipate we're going to be changing our base load because we, we still have to provide reliable service and we can't be certain at exactly at the time that, number one, they don't, the sun has yet to shine at night. Uh, and 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 when we encounter cloud cover, uh, obviously we have different different amounts of production. So we we will have the same amount of installed capacity to be able to meet the reliable needs of our customers. Okay. My last question is this: Are there any decent size scales or large scales examples where they just went all in, and then all of a sudden they realize, whoa, we have to pull back? on a feed-in tariff anywhere in the world? Yes, and, and Spain was probably one of the more noted noted ones where they went out with a, lar with a large program, um, found themselves over overcommitted, and it had a, a very material impact on their overall cost of energy. For And the material impact at the end of the day perhaps was an imbalance on their books? We can't sustain that, or what was it? Well, they, they they didn't have the revenue. They didn't have the revenue to pay for what they had committed to contract. Now they don't. And now get back to DWP. If DWP overcommits and we don't have the revenue, what's the most logical step for us not to be in a quandary where we're looking to break these dozens and eventually hundreds and eventually thousands of contracts?
Well, Councilman, who are we going to go to to make to fix that imbalance? Well, the only, there's the only the only source that we can go to for it is, is ultimately to our customers who pay our rates. That's our, every customer, and, whether you're correct. a customer with a rooftop solar adding to the system, or if you're a traditional older customer where you you're not adding into the system, you're just feeding off of it. That's correct, customer. and that's why we're trying to make certain that doesn't happen, so that we go in as eyes open, plan it out, know what we're committing to, know how that fits into our total costs, and know that we can cover those costs with the rates that our customers pay. And and you're confident that the streamlined system that you just pointed out, it, it sounds like what you're doing is, I hate to use this example because it's a bad word these days, you're basically going to uh, like a, a pre-qualify system, which is four pages, and then once they see that they're on a broad base, it looks like they, they're somebody we can do business with, then you're going into the detail, kind of like an underwriting on a loan. Pre-qualify, and then after that, then you get into the detailed underwriting of, of the actual thing before you agree to a contract, correct? Yes. Do you yes. feel confident that that, that system is going to work? Yes, yes. And in the four, in the six months that I was referring to, this is when we will integrate these systems in a manner that is reliable. And when Mike talked about geographic diversity, this, when we integrate, we're going to spread these systems out. Okay. So we yeah. don't have everything concentrated in one section. Okay. But yes, we are confident. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what, what are the uh, issues of compliance with SB 32 that aren't in this report? What are the fundamental, what are the fundamental uh, requirements of SB 32? The fundamental requirements of SB 32 is that LEDWP shall offer a program up to 75 megawatts. And the thing about SB 32 is, is they do not have a deadline noted. So we are responsible for offering a program until we reach that 75. Okay, so the 75 um, is, a, is a minimum? Once we reach 75, we have finished our duty of uh, the mandate. It's not my question. Oh, sorry. So the 75 is the minimum? That is correct. Uh, and the, um, but the implementation uh, time frame for reaching that 75 is not indicated in the bill. They have not specified a particular date to implement the 75 megawatts. Uh, who interprets that timeline given the fact we don't have a timeline in the bill? Who interprets the timeline? Well, yeah. Who sets the guidelines for what that timeline well, is? Well, our, our proposal is really based on the 2010 Integrated Resource Plan where we're trying to stack in every resource. I don't think that was my question. But that Let me ask my question again. Who sets the time frame? Our, our board and the council sets the timeline at for the, state, the guidelines, the ordinance. implementing a bill at the state? Okay. I'm trying to figure out who's the authority to require us to have a timeline on implementing the 75. Our board is, is our governing body that sets the timeline. So they allow us to set the timeline? The bill allows us to have our governing bodies to set the schedule to, for implementation. Okay, so we set that at what? The timeline that we have proposed right now is to get... So we don't have a timeline set. Well, we're, we're proposing a timeline and that ultimately our board would have to adopt, which it has not yet done. This is a timeline for implementation. I'm right. just trying to figure out who's interpreting the state, the SB 32 rule, in terms of when is the deadline for when you got to get to the 75. I, I, I'm unaware of there being any specific uh, basis by which uh, the state legislature can so come, we, back, can so come back, or others can come back and say you haven't you haven't met it. Okay, so we don't have at, a at we don't, juncture. So we don't have to uh, buy by uh, SB 32 if they don't have a timeline. We really don't have pressure to implement something in terms of the state law. The consequences of not meeting it, I, I guess, are are not clear. That's that's correct, Councilman. Okay, uh, so so I, I just want to make it very clear that we're, that we're creating a program that is essentially subsidized by all the ratepayers uh, because we're gonna we're gonna pay people for generating power 
a rate that is much higher than the average rate using any other source of power. So the ratepayers of Los Angeles are paying for this this program. That's correct. But along along with that along with that program come comes um, the the job benefits that that come from that. It is also part of this these. This amount of energy also meets our renewable yes portfolio. No. I just so. wanted a yes or no. The rate payers of Los Angeles are subsidizing this program as yes. you are proposing it. They are funding the program. Okay. How much, uh, how much are they paying for it? So we're going to allow a few users to create a system. We're going to pay them a very high rate. How much are we going to pay them? An average. What was the when the numbers we talked about in council the other day? Well, on page three is the amount that we've budgeted right. that we're, we're going What's to. What's the average we're going to pay these people? The cost per kilowatt hour is going to be determined through a competitive process initially, so we can do some price discovery. How much? <laughs> He says, what's the range that you think we're going to be? How much? It's going to be about 17 to 18 cents. Okay, 17 to 18 cents. What is the average uh, rate that a, a rate payer pays? What's our blended rate? Our blended rate for cost of production. Without it's this. It's about 12 cents. 12 cents. All in. That's all in. So the rate payers are subsidizing this with 5 cents. The, is that the, is yes or no? It goes in, yes, it goes into the revenue requirements and the, the entire rate payer base. Okay, I just want everybody to know that the rate payers are funding what will be a, maybe a hundred users, right? <coughs> Who tells when the uh, as shown on page three of this here? It's like about three and a half cents a month to the average cut to our all average customers for the ten megawatts. I don't care uh, what it is. Right. You know, we haven't had a ratepayer uh, advocate to analyze this in terms of its impact on the ratepayers. And and what are we going to do with this? and what is the proportion of power that is going to be generated by this minuscule program in terms of its impact on the system as a whole? Point five percent. Point five percent. Yes. This was supposed to be a quick presentation. And and what other what other renewable portfolio what other things do we have in our renewable portfolio? We have wind we have wind resources. Um, we and have, what percentage do they provide? Uh, wind is about fifty percent of our total renewable. Uh, so fifty percent of our renewable energy, of which we're at twenty percent. How much does that cost? So it's us? about. Well, just complete complete the answer to the question. And so it's it's about 10 percent of our total energy right now, roughly, is wind, and that costs around 11 cents. So it costs less than the average cost on the ratepayer. Yes, it, yes, it does because but that this average cost includes cents, all the distribution costs. And it costs. adds 0.5 percent. Right. Okay, so this adds. I'm just I'm just trying to right. understand this. This will will increase the cost to the ratepayers. We could purchase the same amount of power for 11 cents through wind and it would decrease the cost to the ratepayer. I don't get it. Well, the difference what is the difference? The difference, what is the, difference? The, 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 the difference is, is we don't have wind resources inside the city of Lo, uh, city of Los Angeles. How about natural we gas? We do have solar. How about natural inside. gas? Uh, how well, much does that cost? Um, natural gas costs about around seven cents, six, seven cents. You know what really concerns me about this is is we have no idea where you're going with this whole thing. Now, I'm not just talking about solar. I'm talking about the whole package. Well, we actually and and which and and we never had an analysis from you as to which one is going to get get us to where we need to go faster. Well, I, actually, we have an integrated resource plan where we've laid out what those different mixes are will be between wind and solar and geothermal or energy efficiency programs or biogas programs and laying all that what each component costs and what we estimate that cost to be. Um, 
as, as our renewable portfolio as well as what, what we estimate our, our cumulative cost to be for our coal uh, at level that we have as it, as it comes down over time and our natural gas as well. So we, that is laid out and presented in our integrated resource plan last year and we're right in the process of updating that at present for the, for the upcoming year. Well, we need to update it uh, quick uh, and I think we also need to bear in mind the, uh, the, the desired uh, transition that you know, we want to we want to move to a renewable portfolio as quickly as possible, and we want to maximize the use of that. But at the same time, we have to be cost efficient. It seems to me that this is a very expensive model uh, that generates very little power to our system and costs all of our ratepayers. I, I don't understand that when only a few hundred are going to benefit from it. It's like the one percent is getting getting the rate payer, it would be great if I could get every rate payer to give me a penny a day, I would be a very happy person. And that's essentially what you're, what you're asking the rate payers to do. Give a few, a few people a penny a day. Mr. Eller. And I don't think that's right. Well, let me, let me also say this. We have a lot of cards on this line. I meant two more council members who want to speak. All well, it's a big issue. Oh, I know it is. But I also why, have, I also have a question the about. the project so we could get it started and see how it goes without damaging people. Damaging people? Yeah. And AB 30. Which people? Yeah. Yeah. Great pairs. See how well, it goes. I, I just, I'm just extremely, the, the, I have to ask this question about the 20 years do you anticipate that the technology related to solar is going to increase in cost or decrease in cost? Uh, we expect it has gone down. We expect it will continue to so go how down. How are you going to no negotiate 20-year uh, contracts with the anticipation that technology is going to improve, reduce the cost, well, because and, and the you cost lock in a rate at 17 cents, and maybe we can produce solar for, for 9 cents in 10 years? How are you going to have a 20-year contract, and the rate payers are going to have to subsidize that? Well, the time at which someone commits to to provide energy to us under a contract, they're paying what the market cost is to put that solar panel on on their on their roof, and and the payment amount that we're making is amount that amount that will be necessary to pay off the, pay off the cost of that over over. Well, a I suggest life. twenty years is far too long on a technology that will move forward very quickly once we build a market. And and if you if you lock in 20 years, you're going to end up with with the the ratepayers uh, uh, paying a tremendous subsidy in the last 10 five to 10 years, unnecessarily because the technology will have advanced and we can get it for much cheaper, and that doesn't make any sense to me. Well, each our anticipation is that each year, one of the reasons that we're looking at at phasing this in is that each year, as those costs come down and the next, the market costs come down. The next contract for the next increment no, will I be will yes, lower. I suggest that you build into the current contracts a method to take into consideration advanced technology. Is that we reduce costs? They should not be given a boondoggle in the last ten years of this, these contracts simply because they've got old technology. Well, Council Member, with all due, due respect, if you if you purchase a home for 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 three hundred thousand dollars and you enter into a mortgage, you have you, you're paying you're paying thirty years on that. If the cost if the cost next next year comes down, you could have purchased that house at at two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars. I don't think you can go back to your bank and and ask them to reduce the mortgage amount just because the market price went down. And that's kind of what we're talking about that's here. That's a bad example to use in this market. A well, lot of people tried that method and they went bust. What you are suggesting is essential. Are you familiar with swap deals? I am. What what you are locking us into is a swap deal. And down the road, we're going to lose a lot of money, and the ratepayers are going to have to pay for it. All right. I, I don't. I don't hear an answer to that question. Why don't we? Why don't we circle back to you, Mr. Alarcon, uh, Mr. Krikorian, and Mr. Labans, and then if we want to speak some more, then we have a huge stack of cards on number two. So again, I'll give everyone one minute apiece. We're trying to figure out what to do about number four because clearly we're going to run out of time. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. We've got about 100 people patiently waiting to, to speak, so I'll try to be as brief as I, I can. Um, uh, 
first let me just say that uh, well I think we're, we're all aware that SB 32 doesn't have a compliance deadline. Uh, we are also equally aware that AB 32 certainly does. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, do we not also have obligations to meet uh, our RPS mandates under certain guidelines and certain deadlines? Uh, and those have mandatory deadlines that you're endeavoring to, to meet as well. Yes, Correct. Do. And yes. the FIT and program, part, this is the a, fit part program is a component of our RPS compliant, and it's a component of our uh, greenhouse gas reduction goals under AB 32 as, as well. Is that right? Yes, it is. All right. And I, I just want to say I have to disagree uh, with my colleague uh, about the analysis that's been done. Uh, I think that the IRP, uh, most recent IRP, provides a comprehensive and detailed analysis of many different policy options that are before this city and it's up to us as policymakers to decide uh, which course we choose to take and what and certainly we have to be aware of rate impacts of course uh, and that's exactly the decision that's before us um, uh, but it, it isn't for lack of analysis the analysis is there we just have to figure out as policymakers what do we choose to do in meeting our clean air obligations and meeting our gre greenhouse gas uh, reduction obligations and meeting our renewable energy obligations which are imposed upon us by the state uh, and also by our own commitment to the environment so um, anyway so I want to ask you briefly uh, I know Edison in meeting their uh, FIT obligations under SB 32 has a program by which each month they reassess what their rate will be. Uh, I think it's on a monthly basis in order to make sure that they have the, um, An know, offering. the current market uh, rate properly set. Is that something that we can consider doing in order to address some of the concerns that Mr. Alarcon raised so that we're not rolling out a rate that's too high and then it turns out that uh, we're oversubscribed? Just to be clear, Edison has actually has a couple of programs. One is their Crest program, which is their feed-in tariff type program, and they do set a price that's based on the market or their avoided costs. And it's a program that has a very long queue, but almost no solar is being built. Now, what Edison has done is then they've launched another program, which is uh, an auction-type mechanism where they're trying to figure out what that pricing should be so that solar can be built and it's cost-effective. So in our demonstration program, we do want to do price discovery to help facilitate that. Then as we look at a long-term program, we can make some decisions based on what Edison's doing. We're going to watch the PUC very, very carefully because they're wrestling with this as well. And we'll use all of that as input before we launch a full-blown program. Okay. Now, uh, I know SMUD has both a robust FIT program and also, I think, uh, another solar program. I don't know if it's a RAM or how they work that other program. But, but in their FIT, uh, have you looked at the pricing models that other munis in California who are ahead of us in this have used? And can you talk about... Yes, the SMUD, the SMUD program is they set a price at the beginning. It was a relatively low price, and they had a queue that was filled in one day. And it's literally taken years for the prices of solar to drop to the point where developers can actually start building solar. And we know some of their first projects are being built now, and it's been about two, a little over two years in the making. And most of those projects are ground-mounted projects. All of those projects are ground-mounted uh, projects. They have, they have land space, some of the farming communities up and around uh, the Sacramento area. And is from that perspective, they can hit those very, very low standard offer price. How about uh, any of the other munis that uh, have already adopted a fit? What, what, what kind of pricing? Have, have any adopted a similar model as, as what you're describing? The, the, there, there are not a whole, besides SMUD, there are not a whole lot of other munis that have really launched uh, effective programs in California. We have seen some other examples in other states uh, have launched uh, feed-in tariff type programs. Okay. So one of the cost issues in this uh, is going to be interconnection and how 
how this contributes to system reliability or detracts from system reliability. It's, it's when you have distributed generation, it gets complicated to keep your system uh, reliable. So is there any way consistent with the idea of first come, first served with a standard feed-in tariff that you can differentiate geographically from uh, in, in where it would best serve the interests of the system and system reliability and reduce the interconnection costs and all that with a fit. Is there any way to do that? Or do you just literally have to take first come, first serve, as it says in, in SB 32, regardless of whether you need it in a particular part of the city or if you would prefer it to be in another part of the city. I, I think and this goes also to the intermittency issue that yeah. Mr. Cardenas raised, I think, because I, if, if you're over-concentrated in one area, it seems to me you lose the you lose the um, diversification benefit that that the distributed generation is supposed to provide in the first this, place. This is a very good question. I think Council Member Cardenas kind of hit on that. I think the, the interconnection studies are going to basically sort out that priorities because of the voltage support and other reliability issues that the customer doesn't have the responsibility to respond to. So our system, our grid, the transmission, the sub-transmission and the distribution systems that we have have to prioritize that, that injection points coming into our system and that pricing of that interconnection will be the sorting mechanism for us to, uh, to make sure that everything that we take fits in our system properly so our reliability is not compromised. Okay, so there's no question under first come, first served under SB 32 that you still have enough latitude to be able to make that differentiation. Right, and I think this is something that we've learned from other models like the Germany and the Spain model where the interconnections was, was indiscriminate as far as the system interconnection and that has caused a lot of pricing and reliability issues that we don't want to repeat here. Okay, thank you. Mr. LeBond. Thank you. First and foremost, uh, first time publicly here, I've seen Water and Power. Thank you for your response in the storm and the crews throughout the city. Uh, it was very a, a challenging time with the windstorm, so I wanted to personally thank you and the power side for that. Number two, if you look at the people that are out here right now, I want you to look at them and think they're a park or a school or a library. All I want with solar from DWP first is to take care of the schools, the parks, and the library so that tariff could come back to the public first. But I know that's not in front. That's all I wanted to say. You got, you know what I'm pushing. You're going to figure this thing out like you figured out the aqueduct and uh, just come back to us when it's appropriate. Uh, I appreciate it. But thank you for your action in the uh, storms. But also what I really want to see, the money that we go to this is to help the parks, the schools, and the libraries. Because this is all going to be figured out by business and people who have the uh, means to do. But the parks and libraries are being stretched due to this tough change in government. Uh, times that if we could put a panel on every park, on every school rooftop, I'm sure there's a lot of power we could generate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Labonge. Now, we have a lot of cards, and each person is going to get one minute each so that we can be fair, and everyone will have the opportunity to speak. And we have uh, four chairs there. All right, and then why don't I make this announcement now because I want to make sure that we do not give short shrift to item number four. And so I've asked the chief legislative analyst to make sure that we have time on Thursday. Thursday? Thursday morning. At Thursday morning. At what time? At 8.30. 8.30 a.m. Can we get this room? We'll work with the clerk on that matter. All right, we're working on that. And then... Um, Uh, so we will make that a single issue agenda just on the plastic bags. And if, uh, Mr. Clerk, can I save these cards and then use them for Thursday? Madam Clerk? It's up to people if they want to come back. All right, well, um, all right, well, why don't we, I, I just wanted to tell, tell all right, if the, if the people want to come back, uh, we can use these same cards. If you don't want to come back, I will read your name into the record. If you want to submit anything in writing, uh, you can do that into the official record. Uh, and Madam Clerk, would you give them your email? It's on the agenda. Okay, it's on the agenda. All right, great. Uh, but uh, we're going to go through the cards on item two now. And I'm going to call up four people at a time so we can get through this as quickly as possible. And there will be one minute each. James Brennan. 
Aura Vasquez, Kathy Seal, and Peter Gutierrez. And anything less than a minute goes back into the grid. <laughs> That's very good, Tom. Thank you. See, you really understand. <laughs> Proof positive that Mr. LeBond understands speed and tariff. <laughs> All right, James Brennan. Uh, Aura Vasquez. Is Aura Vasquez still here? Okay, come on up. Kathy Seal, are you? Okay, Kathy, great. And then Peter Gutierrez. Okay, let's go. So we can get everybody in. Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you for your leadership on this issue and council members for your attention to the Clean Energy Policy of Los Angeles. Um, I want to first mention that there's a story that's been uh, widely reported now that Los Angeles has reached solar grid parity for uh, 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 solar power, meaning that solar, even without your rebate, is now cost competitive with utility provided power in Los Angeles uh, through a group, group purchasing process. However, uh, what we're hearing from DWP is that the commercial rebate program is about to go offline after being online for uh, less than half of this year and it will be come back online not until July. We need to have a full-time program, not a part-time effort in Los Angeles. We also need to have a set price. There were some questions about the price. Um, I think it's important to note that solar power should be compared to the peak period natural, natural gas that it's offsetting in the middle of the day uh, and over a 20-year contract, and that most importantly to address the questions of who's going to be benefiting, the uh, feed-in tariff program should include a community solar bill credit so that every single rate payer in Los Angeles can purchase or lease one of these feed-in tariff panels Thank you. and use it to offset okay. their electric bill. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Mr. Brennan, and then... Uh, uh, um, Aura? Yeah. yeah Hi. Aura's next. Good morning. Um, my name is Aura Vasquez. I am a representative Shh. for the Sierra Club and the LA Beyond Coal campaign. So the Sierra Club uh, would like to recognize the members of this council and the Energy and Environment Committee um, for their leadership to advance sustainable solutions that are good for consumers and the environment. As we face out of, you know, dirty coal consumption, we should look for opportunities to generate cl clean power here in Los Angeles. Every year we send hundreds of millions of dollars out of state to buy dirty and increasingly expensive coal power. By supporting a, 70, a 75 megawatt um, solar feed and tariff program beginning next year, we can start to bring our bills back home and invest in our local economy. Um, the economic benefit of the uh, Clean LA Solar Program will be tremendous. Uh, they thank, thank, thank you. you. Okay, Kathy Seal, Peter Gutierrez, and uh, Scott Connors, can you come on up? Scott Connors? Okay, thank you, Kathy. Good morning. I'm also with the Sierra Club Beyond Coal campaign. We're a grassroots effort, and we've been going door to door all over the city and talking about rooftop solar and finding that this is what people want. And in fact, they think that they can sell it back already to the city, showing that this is a logical and desirable program. Um, and we also think that it cannot be, uh, will not raise people's bills if it's combined with robust energy efficiency programs, because as you know, energy efficiency is the cheapest way to um, bring on renewable energy. We support this plan because it will create jobs, which you all know are so extremely important to our city and help us get out of coal, which is unhealthy, which basically is killing people, and which also is creating tremendous amounts of greenhouse gases. So this will help us as a city show the way towards a cleaner environment. We would love to have a robust FIT program, 75 megawatts by 2014. We think this is reasonable and doable and can be reliable. So please support a strong Thank rooftop solar program. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Gutierrez, following Mr. Gutierrez, will be... Um, I forgot your name. Scott. Scott. And then after Scott will be Ernesto Pan Panteja. Good morning, Ma Madam Chair and members of the committee. I want to thank uh, the Chairwoman for uh, all of her efforts and, and the leadership and the leadership that Council is showing on, on, this, uh, on this matter. Um, the feed-in tariff is important to Los Angeles. We have untapped solar resources here. 
the coalition that has been brought together to support this program of business, uh, the environmental groups, and nonprofits is somewhat unprecedented. Uh, we're happy to see that there is now a schedule. Uh, that's important, and it's important to remember that this is going to be part of a larger effort that's going to take shape over the course of time, and 75 megawatts is just a start. Uh, the potential for solar in this city is unlimited, and we could have 600 megawatts, 800 megawatts eventually, and more in this city, and I think that's what we need to be thinking towards a really robust future of solar in this city. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Scott Canas? And then uh, Ernesto Panteja, and then Dr. Tom Williams, are you still here? Come on up. And then um, Adam Marvel. Hey, Scott. Thank you, Council Members, for your time this morning. I can see that you've spent a lot of effort studying this, and I'm fairly new to it. I'm just a community member, but I hear this, and I think this is a great way for Los Angeles to, you know, insource its own, you. Know, energy generation instead of sending it out of state. I think it's a great way to meet our peak demand needs to provide diversity of power, which is are both critical you know, requirements of the DWP. And if it is a little more expensive at first because solar is new, by the time the 75 megawatts is up and we're ready for more, it will be cheaper and the next contract will be cheaper and each one is so small that I, I don't see it as a you know, a huge impact to ratepayers overall and it is a worthy investment in ourselves. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Panteja? Good morning, uh, committee members. My name is Ernesto Pantoja. I'm here on behalf of Sergio Rascon, the business manager for Labor's Local 300. We're here in support of the FIT uh, tariff program. Um, we believe that this is uh, unprecedented, where you have so many entities that are working together to, to create something good uh, for the environment, for the city, for the residents. Uh, but most importantly for labor, it's uh, big because it's going to create jobs, thousands of jobs, sustainable, good-paying, middle-class jobs. And for us, we need to know that it's going to happen 75 megawatts by 2014, 150 megawatts by 2016. We need to make sure that we have fixed pricing. We want to make sure that um, you understand the need that the jobs stay here because we understand the six megawatt demo uh, was sent to Owens Valley, but the job need is here. We need to create that here. Um, and speaking as a rate payer in the city of Los Angeles, I would gladly pay five extra cents to know that we're going to create sustainable middle class jobs. Thank you. Dr. Williams and then Adam Marvel, can you come on up? Michael? Khan, would you please come to the table? Okay. Dr. Williams. Dr. Tom Williams, LA32 Neighborhood Council Board Member. Uh, there's no free lunch. Solar renewables will cost us money. We don't know exactly how much over the life of the projects. 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, 400 years, which is the replacement cycle now. Uh, but let's go back to some things. The DWP general manager just said, in the city of Los Angeles. And the brochure in there that they presented today, it said, near the load centers. Let's make it clear. All these programs should be within the boundaries of the city of Los Angeles, not outside. Very big port. Reserve some for single family residences because a five kilowatt unit on the roof will provide most people with a lot of power that they need. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Williams. Your next, can you state your name? I missed My name is Adam Marvel, and I'm from the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council. Uh, I wanted to mention two points this morning. One for single family households to advocate for that being an option for the FIT tariff initially, and also because I want to. Uh, reinforce the importance of a price that is established and locked in, not a variable price for people who are developing or considering bundling with a number of, of homes in an area, knowing the price will uh, allow them and ensure that they can go ahead with these plans. And also, to speak to that, I would strongly speak against a pre-qualify. I would want, rather than a manipulation of the process, an actual streamlined, uh, simplified process that everybody can understand from the beginning to the end, not readjusted. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Michael Kahn and then Mike Watley. Is Mike Watley still here? And then looks like Stella Servas. Stella? Is it Stella or Estrella? Stella. And then Michelle Garakian. Come on up. Okay, Michael, you're first. Thank you. Michael Kahn from Kahn Solar, uh, Council Members. Um, I'm a solar power contractor in the city of Los Angeles, and I'm in support of a, a feed-in tariff. It, it would help augment the uh, solar incentive program, which um, would keep our commercial crews and the commercial crews of other contractors working uh, because the solar incentive program runs out of money in the commercial aspect every year. So this would help with uh, economic development it, the program really should be based in the base in here, yes. and, um, and it needs to be a set price. Uh, almost all of the cost of a solar power system is up front. There's very little maintenance, there's very little cost, there's no fuel. So a solar power system, all the costs are up front uh, with the installation. Uh, a feed-in tariff with a fixed rate of about 14 to 18 cents would really make for a successful program here in sun-drenched Los Angeles. The, um, it's just good for economic development. It's good for the environment. It's good for the city. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mike. Let's see. You're who was Mike? Mike Watley. You're Mike Watley. Okay, great. And then while we're um, let me see, I want to get one more person up here. Uh, Michelle Kinman, come on up. If you're still here, great. Okay, Mike Watley, you're next. Good morning. I'm Mike Watley. I represent Sun Power Corporation. I'm a business developer for the firm. I heard from both the department and the committee the program objectives of being reliable, dependable, sustainable over the long haul. And if that is truly a main objective, then I would strongly suggest that the department and the committee uh, further consider de uh, developer qualifications in the selection of projects for the feed-in tariff. Uh, the developer will be responsible for operating and maintaining the system and they need the experience of financial strength to adequately respond to operational issues, warranty issues, and the potential for system failures to maintain those reliable aspects. And so, as I understand, such qualifications are only considered as tiebreakers, and such projects are often selected based on lowest cost or first come, first serve. And that could be quite dangerous, as we've seen with other utilities. Selecting based on lowest cost doesn't necessarily give you the uh, highest probability project. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I would encourage the Department and the Committee uh, to inc further include developer qualifications in their selection criteria. Thank you. Estrella? Estrella? Good morning, yes. Um, my name is Estrella Service. I work with the California Environmental Justice Alliance, CEHA. CEHA is a statewide alliance of EJ organizations across the state representing over 25,000 community members, and that includes communities for a better environment here in Los Angeles, some in the Bay Area, the San Joaquin Valley, the Inland Valley, and San Diego. Um, we work with community members who are extremely impacted by fossil fuel activities from refineries to diesel trucks, all which create severe health and quality of life impacts. And we've both worked on AB 32 implementation, the RPS, and are trying to implement a feed-in tariff policy at the statewide level. Um, LA has tremendous solar potential, particularly in the multifamily market. A feed-in tariff program is specified in SB 32 allows rooftop solar that requires utilities to offer a fixed price. This is solar that can be installed in low-income communities on multifamily rooftops, which can create jobs, um, local health impacts, um, and more. Um, we support the proposed um, program to implement a feed-in tariff, um, 75 megawatts by 2014 and 100 megawatts by 2016. Thank you so much. Thank you. Michelle Garakian, and then can I have Michelle Kinman is here, and then Leslie Duboff. Duboff? Is Leslie still here? Okay, come on up. And then Carolyn... <laughs> Kasavan, and then last, Mary Leslie. Hello. Uh, okay, somebody pull up an extra chair so everybody can just sit at the table. Just pull a chair from the front row and come on up. Okay, Michelle Garakian. Uh, thank you, committee members and uh, the DWP representatives that are here today. Uh, I just want to take time to applaud uh, both you guys and the DWP for providing a streamlined application and uh, a timeline today. Uh, it's very much appreciated on behalf of our coalition. Um, however, you know, the intent of AB 32 is to offer a fixed price. That's what the, the author, uh, Senator Mc Negretti McLeod, intended when she first authored this bill. Um, so it is also our intent to protect the ratepayer. So we'd like to see a fixed price because it allows developers to have certainty, um, but something probably no more than about 14 to 15 cents. We don't need to get up high 
in the 20, 25 cent region. Um, further, as far as administration uh, in the handout that was offered today, uh, they're showing, DWP is showing at least 20 people in the second year and maybe 40 in the third. Uh, SMUD, which Councilman Krikorian uh, talked about earlier, they have a 100 megawatt feed-in tariff and they have one person to uh, administer that program. That's all they need. Um, thirdly, okay, thank you. I've got to let everybody have a chance. <laughs> Michelle Kinman. Hi, I'm the Clean Energy Advocate for Environment California, a statewide citizen-funded environmental advocacy organization. And I would like to thank the committee for giving this timely and critical issue your attention today. DWP has outlined five sound goals for the feed-in tariff demonstration program, reliability, cost-effectiveness, dependability, sustainability, and transparency. Unfortunately, as currently proposed, it is unlikely that the program will meet these goals. As has been expressed by members of the solar industry, real estate industry, environmental community, and neighborhood groups, a fixed price is necessary to give developers, owners, and operators the financial certainty to participate in the program from the beginning, while also allowing more equitable participation and preventing programmatic gaming. In addition, in order to signal that LA is worth investing in, the city should implement a minimum of 75 megawatts by 2014 and 150 megawatts by 2016. There are several examples worldwide from which we can learn of feed and tariff programs that were designed at a sizable scale and are successfully driving a solar market. If a fixed price larger scale program is not established from the outset, there's a risk of not meeting our goals. Thank you. Uh, Mary Leslie, come on up. Uh, uh, Le Jessica Duboff. Good morning. My name is Jessica Duboff. I'm here on behalf of the LA Chamber of Commerce. Building a robust local green economy in our region is a high priority for our 1,600 business member organizations. Sorry. California leads the nation in clean and green innovation and the development of sustainable business practices that will be an economic engine for the next decade. Hitting 20% renewables was a great achievement for our city, and we'd like for Los Angeles to continue leadership in this arena. The Chamber would like to see a true market competitive feed-in tariff program that meets mandates set out by the state legislature and is inclusive to all businesses who would like to participate. We hope this demonstration project lays the groundwork for that. The popularity of the solar incentive program is proof that Los Angeles residents are interested and excited about renewable programs that allow them to take advantage of the natural resources Los Angeles has to offer. We hope for continued partnership with the Department of Water and Power on the development of a quality feed and tariff program. Thank you. Thank you. Carolyn Casavan. Hi. Um, I'm the president of the San Fernando Valley Green Team, and we support the FIT program. You know, the city needs to meet our renewable energy goals. The advantage of the FIT is we're investing in, um, in the city instead of in the desert. It provides local jobs and business development. It's very important. Uh, I recently talked with someone with a program where they are training solar installers, and 90% of their graduates are getting jobs in the desert, not in the city. So we, not only are we paying to install solar in the desert, we're training our own uh, residents to end up going to work in the desert instead of staying here in the city. And um, the implementation cost can probably be further reduced maybe by taking a look at the interconnection and streamlining that like the uh, application process was streamlined. And then early implementation costs, they are higher, and, but in the long run, they reduce the cost for everyone. And I think we're seeing that with regard to solar right now. Thank, thank you. you. Mary Leslie. I just want to thank this committee for um, a year's worth, or plus, a year's plus worth of work, um, particularly you, um, Chairman Jan Perry. And also, I want to commend the DWP today. Um, this is really um, the best document I've ever seen. Um, the application process, I think, is amazing. The fact that it's down to two pages for the application is really meritorious and hopefully will be a statewide model for people. Um, I, I also am concerned about the administrative overhead. I think it would be terrific if we could lower the cost of the program, and we would like to work with DWP on that. Also, we'd like to know if there's going to be regular reporting on the progress of the program. Um, okay, terrific. And, and, and um, Councilman LeBons, to your point about municipal solar, we share your enthusiasm for it. There is almost 800 megawatts of utility-based solar in the long-term plan. We're just hoping to get a couple hundred megawatts um, in addition to the SIP for the FIT so that we can take full advantage of those federal tax credits and bring hundreds of millions of dollars into L.A. economy for jobs. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, now, I am going to recommend and uh, that we move forward on the timeline and then also simultaneously ask uh, the department to come back to us in 45 days. Uh, 
and the CLA can let us know what date that would be, to report back on the, uh, your progress. And I want ongoing progress reports and that we uh, are, are moving forward on this. But as for today, I think uh, the report reflects that we've made an enormous, the department has made an enormous amount of progress in uh, moving this concept forward. And I, I, I want to express my appreciation very much to Mr. Nichols and his team and uh, for being responsive to what the various stakeholders have articulated for several years now. So thank you very much. So if there's no objection to that, a right, second from Mr. Uh, Kerkorian, we'll move forward on that. Uh, CLA tells us that we can do, did you want to vote? No? No? Okay, good. All right. Uh, CLA tells us we can do three rather quickly. Yeah. Number three relates to public works report relative to the air treatment facility review study. Thank you, everybody. Uh, there are no cards on this side. There's no cards on number three. This was going to be a note and file item. Uh, can you s speak very quickly on that, Mr. Haji Khalil? Good morning, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Council Members. Uh, Adel Haji Khalil, uh, Assistant Director of Bureau of Sanitation. Uh, this is good news. Uh, as you know, uh, as a result of the settlement agreement on the collection system, we had to address sewer orders and sewer spills. Sewer spills have been reduced by over 85 percent. Sewer orders were required to build air treatment facilities at seven locations. After we constructed the large sewers, we were able to understand more how the air moves, and we wanted to make sure that the investment that's being made is worthwhile investment in building these expensive facilities. We did an analysis, asked for two years to review this. We were able to defer and not build four facilities and still meet the requirements of the agreement and reduce sewer orders by not building four facilities in the communities and that's the savings about fifty million dollars. So uh, I want to basically acknowledge the work of the staff in looking at how we best to serve the community but I think this is good news here. We're able to watch how we're spending the money and make sure we're spending the money in the right place and it's effective. So we're able to save fifty million dollars. Thank you very much Mr. Haji Khalil. Uh, and this will be a note and file item Without objection, a um, mini report that includes saving fifty million dollars. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good report. <laughs> this is a good day. Now, uh, again, we'll do item four on Thursday, and yeah. it'll, the no notice will be posted. Um, this marks the end of the agenda. Yeah. Just, just to indicate, so you know, uh, item number four is also scheduled for council consideration tomorrow. So there'll be a need to inform the council of the special meeting on on this Thursday. Well, we'll have to inform the council today, correct, that we have a special meeting on this tomorrow sure. so that there is no confusion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, but we got a lot of cards. We got a lot of cards. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. It's just for me. All right. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll uh, inform council downstairs today that we'll be hearing this matter Thursday. Sure. Um, now, this is the uh, part of the agenda for public comment. For those wishing to comment on items that are not on the agenda, we only had one card from Dr. Williams, and I don't see him in here, so the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>